Uh, once again, my name is Brett Maynard, and uh, I did just uh, retire from Marshall University back in January, but I'm still involved with the university doing adjunct uh, teaching. But my 9 to 5 job, uh, I, I now quit doing it. So it gives me a little bit more time to do this, my uh, hobby, which I truly enjoy, which is uh, doing astrophotography. So uh, what I want to talk about today is uh, the type of equipment you might want to use depending on the target in the sky that you are wanting to try to image. And we'll go from uh, planets, which is the longest focal length that we would be imaging at, and I'll talk about that, uh, all the way to the Milky Way, which is the, the uh, shortest focal length uh, type lens that we would be dealing with. Uh, so some of the concepts, you know, the, the aperture, the focal length, the focal ratio, which is how fast uh, your optical equipment is, your optical train, uh, you know, between fast and slow, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit. And then potentially the image circle, how big is the image coming from your optical equipment uh, being displayed on your, your sensor, because uh, that can have issues as well. Uh, so we'll talk about some of these um, concepts. So uh, the field of view, um, and we'll be talking in this in angular measurements, so degrees, minutes, and seconds. How big are these these things that we're wanting to image? Um, and here's some just various sizes. So if we start with the planets, and these are the maximum sizes that we can see up at the maximum, because as we go around the sun and they're going around the sun, we're always changing how far away we are from our sister planets, so they get bigger and smaller throughout the year. So these are the maximum sizes that we, uh, we can see. Uh, Mars is 25 uh, arc seconds, and it looks like a star, it looks like an orange star. Uh, Jupiter, which is up now, as well as Saturn, they look like really bright stars, so they're just like pinpoints in the sky. Uh, 25 arc seconds, 50 arc seconds, you know, 60 arc seconds would be one arc, uh, arc minute. So they're not very big, just points in the sky. Um, the moon um, is, you know, everybody knows how big the moon is, the, the largest extent, you know, the moon is the same type of thing. The moon isn't in a perfect orbit around the Earth, it's kind of an uh, offset orbit, so it gets smaller and bigger. We have the super moons and the smaller moons. And it's just over half a degree, you know, 34 uh, arc minutes in, 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 in size. Then we get into the Orion Nebula, which is a little bit bigger. The Andromeda Galaxy, it would be great if we had the night vision to actually see the full extent of the Andromeda Galaxy, our, our neighbor galaxy, super galaxy. It's uh, three degrees, a little over three degrees wide, which is about six moons. We could put like five or six moons side by side and that's how big the uh, M31 or the Andromeda Galaxy is if we could see the full extent. Now, in a dark sky location like we have here uh, in the mountains, the Black Water Falls, you can actually see the Andromeda Galaxy naked eye, just the central part of it, because uh, it's dark enough. Uh, Barnard's Loop, which is a large uh, hydrogen uh, region around the Orion Nebula, um, or the Orion Nebula, the Orion constellation, kind of goes all the way around it. It's quite large, 10 degrees. And then the Milky Way, which is, you know, it's, it's about 30 degrees wide, but goes all the way across the sky. And tonight, you should be able to see the Milky Way uh, quite well here. Tonight, tomorrow night, it's like to be nice and clear. So, uh, just in general, when we talk about the focal length, the longer the focal length, the smaller the uh, field of view that you can see, whereas with the short focal length, then you get a wider, wider view. Uh, when you start talking about the, uh, the focal ratio, um, the F ratio, the F stop, that's where you can have like an F2 lens or an F2.8 or a, like the telescope, my electron up here is an F10. They get uh, the slower, the higher the number, the longer you have to expose your image because you're getting a dimmer image, whereas a 
lower focal uh, ratio or fast light lens, you're, you don't have to expose quite as long because you're gathering more light, uh, uh, more photons. Okay. So let's talk about planets first. You know, planets need extremely long focal lengths that resolve any type of detail on the surface of the planet. So if you want to see the um, cloud belts on uh, Jupiter, you want to see the rings around Saturn and actually see the divisions in the rings. If you want to see surface features on Mars like Olympus Mons and you know, some of the other uh, albedo, albedo, the light and dark places, clouds you can see on Mars. But you need something that can really magnify those small points in the sky. So what we are using, what I use is, and I'll show this, and anybody wants to ask any questions about this, we can, we can do that as well. This is a, this is a uh, Celestron C8. It's a schmidt cassegrain telescope. I've had this since 1989 uh, when, I, when I purchased this. So it's been, it's a little rough around the edge. It's got some scrapes here and there, but it's still doing great optically. Uh, natively, without doing anything, it's a it's a 2,030 millimeter uh, telescope. So just think of if you ever watch a football game and you see these guys on the sidelines with these huge lenses, you know, taking pictures of the football game. Those are like you know 400, 800 millimeter lenses because they're trying to get up close to the action. You know, this is 2,000 millimeter, so it's significantly longer focal. But even at 2,000 millimeter, if you, if you take an image of the planets are still just real small on your on your camera. So we have to go even further. So what we use is a Barlow lens, which basically is like a tele extender. You either use like a 2x or a 3x Barlow lens, which increases the focal length even greater. So I typically image at uh, 6,000 millimeter. I use a 3x Barlow to try to make the planet that I'm uh, targeting as large as possible. And you just put the Barlow uh, lens in the back here and then you have your camera to the Barlow lens. I can't remember where I brought my Barlow with me in this bag. Yes, I did. So this is a 3x Barlow. So you just put that in your scope and then you put your camera on this. And that magnifies or increases your uh, overall focal length from whatever your native focal length is to two or three times. So if you have a thousand millimeter telescope, a thousand millimeter uh, focal length, you put a three X bar over in there and get three thousand. So you just multiply it by the fat. That's a good one. So this is a picture I took last year. I have a better one I'll show here in just a minute that I took just a couple of months ago. There about a month or so. So this is Jupiter taken with that telescope and the 3x Barlow, and you can see we've got uh, we can see the surface details and a couple of moons and the shadow. So we're actually getting a shadow cast onto Jupiter from one of the moons. I can't remember which moons those were. Typically, Io and Europa are the, are the ones that cast nice big shadows because they're they're bigger. Any questions about planet? One other thing that we do with planets that we do differently than with the deep sky is we do this with video. We take video to do planetary imaging. Because, especially here, um, we're always fighting the jet stream. So we have the jet stream overhead. Uh, if you go out at night and you look up and the stars are twinkling, that's not a good time to do planetary imaging. It's like looking down a highway on a hot summer day, and you can see how the highway just you know is wavy, and you know, have these little mirages and stuff. Well, the same thing's happening through the atmosphere, especially if the jet stream's above, because the air is real turbulent, and all those photons passing through that disturbed air makes the planet dance around and uh, shimmer, and that just destroys the the detail. So what we do is we take video and we take lots of frames. We try to get two or three minutes of video, typically, and the more frames the better. So if you have a high-speed camera, a dedicated uh, 
an imaging camera, you can capture like 100 frames per second. So you might capture 20,000 individual video frames. And then we throw away maybe three-fourths of them because they're, they're blurry, they're, they're distorted. But occasionally, there's, you have these really short moments of, of really good seeing where the, the, the planet just kind of snaps into focus. And we take those, and then we run those through software to stack them on top of each other to bring out more and more detail. So that's what we do with uh, planets here. We take video, and we take lots of, uh, we want lots of frames, and then we throw away most of them and keep the best of the best to actually then process <coughs> them into a final image. So planetary is hard here. The best place to do planetary imaging is down, you know, closer to the, the closer to the equator you are, the better, because you don't have to deal with the jet streams. The jet streams are either in the southern or northern hemisphere, and around large bodies of water, like the ocean or whatever, because you have a nice, stable column of air. And if you see some of these great images that some of these guys um, produce, a lot of them are down in the equatorial regions uh, because they have nice, stable columns of air a lot of the time. We rarely have them. Go to the next one. So the next one we want to talk about are, are galaxies. So I'm going from the, the longest focal length planets to the next longest focal length, which are galaxies. Now, we're lucky that we have a huge sister galaxy, Andromeda, M31, that's huge. It's right next door. Most galaxies are small. So they're hard to uh, uh, see, so you actually have to throw some focal length of galaxies in order to start resolving the same type of issue. You're wanting to resolve details. You want to see the dust lines. You want to see your know, features within the galaxy. So we're still uh, using relatively long focal length, uh, from 180 millimeter uh, up to 2,000 millimeter in focal length. So when I'm talking about 180 millimeter, the majority of my imaging. Typically, I'm doing wide field stuff, uh, you know, some galaxies occasionally, but typically I'm going after the colorful stuff, nebulas and, and uh, you know, the reds and the blues and the, you know, nice, nice uh, colorful images. And I use this lens right here a lot. This is an old 1980-something, uh, early 90s, uh, Nikon, Nikkor, 180 millimeter lens. And so some of the pictures you'll see, I'm going to show the picture gallery of some of the, my most recent images over the past couple of years. And some of those are with this lens right here. Just a, I got this on eBay, relatively cheap. Uh, astrophotographers uh, realize that this is actually a pretty good lens. And so they're a little bit harder to find. Them. It's a Nikkor 180 millimeter prime lens, manual focus. And and then I go up from there. This is um, another Nikon lens, which is uh, 300 millimeter. Uh, so it's a little bit longer focal length. And this is good for like uh, M31, Andromeda Galaxy. The 180 or this one is a really good lens to, you know, to get detail from those particular galaxies. Anything else, then we start moving up into longer and longer focal lengths. The, one of the issues or the challenges with galaxies is most, a lot of the galaxies are, are, are faint. They're hard to see. I mean, even if you look at them through the telescope, there's kind of like gray, fuzzy patches. You can see some detail in a nice uh, big telescope. But when we're trying to catch all those photons, uh, we have to, we, we're, we're running into some challenges. One being the longer the focal length, the slower the scope, the more photons we need, the longer the exposures, the more exposure, so it gets more challenging to start uh, imaging some of these fainter galaxies. And so we, at least I, play some games with that. And one way of doing that is the opposite of the Barlow lens that I have in here right now, which is a, uh, which is, increases the focal length. You can use a focal reducer, which reduces the focal length. So this is an old one I got eBay. Uh, it's an old Lumicon focal reducer, which does quite well. It's right on the back of my uh, C8, and it takes it from a 
F10, 2,000 millimeter, down to around the 1,200 millimeter at F6. So it makes it significantly faster and uh, a shorter focal length. So I don't have to take images quite as long. Uh, you know, the exposures aren't quite as long, so I'm not battling my mount, I'm not battling the seeing, I'm not battling you know, the balance on my scope and stuff. So, you know, if you start imaging long exposures at 2,000 millimeter, that's, that takes some effort and, and trial and error to make sure that you're able to do it. When you put a focal reducer on, it makes it, makes it easier, plus it's faster, you're getting more photons. The image gets smaller, but you, you're, you're being able to capture photons uh, a lot quicker than you would normally. Uh, you can also buy a scope, which I haven't done yet. I, I would like to get a scope that's somewhere around the 800 millimeter range, maybe 600, 800 millimeter, and, uh, and take some images of that. So I have a pretty big jump from 300 to you know, 1200. I don't, I don't have anything in between. Uh, so it, uh, but, but, but for what I typically want to image, that, that range seems to work well. Uh, for most galaxies, uh, as I mentioned, I put the focal reducer in uh, to lower the focal length of my main scope down to 1200 in the C8 with that focal reducer. Okay. So this is, um, was taken uh, earlier this year, I think back March, I can't remember exactly, March, April time frame, so this is M51. Of course, you know, projectors don't do these images justice. If you can see it on the screen, there's a lot more detail. If after we talk or whatever, we're going to actually see the full resolution images rather than what you're seeing on a projector, the more we can, we can you come up with the laptop here and we can take a look at this. So this is, you know, and this takes time. You know, this is, this is I think, a total of about um, six hours of image capture data over three nights to capture a couple of hours per night and then pull all that data together and process it. Uh, typically, uh, I think I was taking um, probably two minute, uh, two to three minute exposures uh, for each one and then I, and I take the best of those. Typically, most of those are good. 90% of my images that I'm doing with the camera are, are, are okay to use. And um, then I, I process those all together, stack those all together to come up with my final, my final image. But you can see the, uh, with the longer focal length you're able to make out within the uh, M51 whirlpool galaxy. You can see the dust lanes. You can see some of the uh, star forming regions that are a little bit uh, pinkish color. That's where there's active, active star formation or the, or the blue areas as well, the kind of the brighter areas. That's where new star formations happening in N51. So here's another uh, galaxy. This is uh, M81 and M82, Bose galaxy, and the cigar. The what? The cigar? But uh, the big one is M81. That's a relatively close neighbor, uh, but it's still you know, 15, 20 million light years away, uh, whereas M31 is like 3 million light years away. So these are pretty far away, um, but they're relatively bright, so they're, they're fairly easy to manage. And this was done with the same setup that I did in 51. This is uh, NGC uh, 4565, uh, I think the, the, the Needle Galaxy. So this is one of the galaxies where we're actually seeing edge on, which is kind of cool. So. Uh, M31, you see pictures of M31, it's, it's kind of, it's not face on. Like M51, we're looking at right at face. And whereas M31 is a little bit of an angle. And here, we're looking edge on, on this galaxy. And you can see the central bulge, as well as, and you can see it much better detail on the screen here, you can see those dust lanes uh, running in the front. So uh, that's some nice, uh, that's a nice image, it's fairly easy to image as well. Okay, so we went from planets at a really long focal length to galaxies at a long focal length, and now let's talk about some, uh, some nebulas. Now, I will put in, there's some other, there's some types of nebulas 
like the ring nebula and uh, some of those that are planetary nebulas that are small and you need the focal length of the same type of long focal length to, to get those as well. What I'm talking about here are some, some of the bigger, bigger ones that you can uh, capture just with the lenses. I, I mainly do lenses uh, with my camera. So some of the ones we'll see here, the North American Nebula is quite large, two degrees by 100 arc seconds. The Bell Nebula, three degrees. The Hart Nebula, uh, two and a half degrees uh, in size. So this is where we're going to start using lenses rather than telescopes to capture uh, these images. Uh, the 180, the 300, even uh, some other lenses I have here. Another one, which is relatively new, and John mentioned I try to do things on the budget, but occasionally I'll treat myself. And so I treat myself to this lens, which is the Sigma 85 millimeter, 1.4. This is, this is an excellent lens. Great for doing uh, wide field astrophotography. And I'll show you some images from that. So you want to go on? So this is, the, uh, this is the North American Nebula. This was taken with 180 millimeter. Uh, Nikon lens. You know, you don't have to have a telescope to take these nebula pictures. They're, they're relatively big in the sky and just a uh, <coughs> relatively not real long focal length 180 millimeter that lens is fairly fast. It's an f2.8, so it's, it's, a, it's a fast lens, so it captures a lot of photons pretty quick. And so uh, the North American nebula gets its name from uh, everybody north of North. I mean, it's, I'll go ahead and show you. So this is this is Florida, this is the Gulf of Mexico, this is Mexico, you know, the East Coast. That's why it gets the uh, the North American uh, name. There's another one in there called the Pelican. Can you guys see the Pelican? Uh, if you know what the Pelican is, has anybody has anybody ever heard of the Pelican then? Anybody who's not heard of the Pelican then? Okay, so do you see the pelican? Okay, so uh, this is the eye, this is the head, and this is beak. And this is kind of the body. So can you see it now? <laughs> so you have to use your imagination. You know, they named these things. There's like the Pac-Man Nebula. There's the the, the bat. You know, the whale. I mean, there's all there's all these different names that people associate with the it's like looking at clouds in the sky. So you kind of have to use your imagination. That's the, it's like a, you're looking at a pelican from the side. So you see his head, his eye, and his feet kind of thing. <coughs> okay, good night. Uh, this is the Orion Nebula. Uh, this was taken also with a 180 millimeter lens. This is, if you're ever going to uh, image uh, a nebula, do the Orion. It's the easiest. It's the brightest. It's, it's easy to do. Uh, it's, there's a couple local challenging things after um, the first one you'll do, you'll see um, if you just take like a one minute exposure of the Orion Nebula, then all this area right here is just completely white. It's all blown out. It's overexposed. So what you do is you take some one minute exposures, then you take some 30 second exposures, then you take some like 10 second exposures, and then you blend all those together. And that way you can see this subtle detail in the central area, which is called the trapezium. There's four stars there, They're really bright, hot, energetic stars that are basically lighting up that whole region. And uh, if you expose it too long, you just it just turns white. It's just like taking a picture outside, you know, and don't have your settings right, it's just, it's just completely white. So that happens there. So this is the Orion that was right there in the sword of the you know, Orion, the hunter. You know, he's got the belt stars, and he's got the sword coming down. The Orion Nebula is right there in, in the soil. Easy to see at night, uh, easy to image. Okay. And this is uh, another, and the, the Orion is a good one during the wintertime, because that's when Orion's up. Uh, also in the wintertime is the Rosette. So this is the Rosette Nebula. And if, if you look at it, it's kind of like a rose. It you know, kind of looks like you're looking down on top of a rose. And uh, it's 180 millimeter telephoto lens. Uh, nothing special. About you know, having a big, you know, big scope training to do these, to do these nebulas. Okay. 
And then when we start talking about uh, wide field, we want to even go wide. So these targets, it's like I'm holding up my thumb, you know, so the, I can cover the Orion Nebula with my thumb, I can cover the rosette with my thumb. Uh, if I hold up like two fingers, I could cover the North American Nebula. So they're not very big. There's, compared to planets and galaxies, they're, they're big. But there's some things we want to even go wider, like the Milky Way. So we want to go really wide field. And you can see uh, images uh, available online where people use like fisheye lens, where they get the whole sky, horizon to horizon. And so you'll see, uh, you'll see people do that. And then you can just go up from there um, to about 85 millimeter focal length before you start uh, going, you know, starting to pinpoint some of the stuff you want. See. Uh, so the type of lenses I use for that is this is an old old lens that I use with my older camera because the main camera I use now, I'll talk about that here in a minute, is a uh, Canon uh, RP and I modified it to make it more sensitive to the hydrogen alpha, the, the reddish pinkish uh, nebula. And that's my main camera now, but I still use this lens occasionally. This is a Takina. Uh, 11 to 16 millimeter zoom. So this is very wide field. You know, 11 millimeter, you, you get a good chunk of the sky. And so that's when you want to take these uh, Milky Way. You want to do uh, time lapse of Polaris. And you want to do the star trails where the stars go in circles. And you can take a lens like this, set your camera on a tripod, take a 30 second exposure, to keep on doing that. Just take 30 second exposures for three or four hours and then you, there's free software that you can take all those images and it'll create nice star traces, you know, around Polaris and more star. Uh, also have a, um, on the cam here's the Canon RP and I've got a 24 millimeter lens on it to do wide field as well. Excuse me. Yes. Are you shooting raw or JPEG? Raw. Never shoot JPEG. Never. No, no, I know that. No, I was wondering, you're shooting that many images. It's taken a long time to download. Oh, yeah. I, I, yeah I'll, I'll take, on any given night, I'll take, uh, if it's a good night and I can keep things going for four or five hours before you know, clouds or fall or whatever might roll in, you know, I'll, I'll take 200 images, you know, raw, and those are about, you know, 40 meg a piece. Are you, have you used the, uh, the c rock? No, I just use the Canon, I just use the, the no, standard. No, no, but I mean, the Canon have two different features now. I, I just, raw I, and a c rock. I, I use the raw, I don't use the c rock. I've read about that, that there's, so whether or not you lose detail or not, I just, I just, I just keep it at the raw. Do you want to go to the next one? So this is, um, this was taken up on Dolly Sons, which is just that way. Um, Dolly, if you're never in the Dolly Sons, you get up to Dolly Sons, especially at nighttime, it's about 4,100 feet in elevation. It's, uh, it's, it looks like a different part of the country up there. Uh, just a, it, it's, a, it's a nice place to go if you've never been. You can, you can't really see it, you can see it on there. On this one, there's a road right here. This is the main fire road, fire service road that runs up to the <coughs> Dolly Sons. And this was taken uh, earlier this year, That's a single exposure, uh, 60 second exposure with that 24 millimeter uh, lens on that Canon, Canon camera. It's nice and dark up there, okay? That wasn't on a tracking mount? No. Just well, a single 60 second exposure. What's the green glow on the horizon? Go, go back. It's like green on the bottom. What is that? That's, um, that's a combination of sky glow, oxygen, and in the distance, when you skip, the closer you get to the horizon, you're looking through more and more atmosphere. So if there's any distant lights down there, you'll kind of get some stuff lighting that up. That's what, is that a city, or what's, what's in that direction? Uh, there's nothing in that direction, but there's still <laughs> stuff down there. I mean, that's heading, that's looking sad. Um, I've got a time lapse, and I should be able to find it. And you can actually see the um, oxygen glows green when it gets when it gets ionized. And you can see these; it's almost like it almost looks like an aurora. At first, I thought, did I capture an aurora? 
uh, because it kind of goes in waves. Uh, uh, this 